Hello folks, I'm Party Moses. This is going to be the first of several tutorial videos showing a little bit about the command and the control on the battle map for Grand Tetation Civil War. Hopefully this is going to lead into a sort of tutorial campaign where I'm going to go show some of the main features of the economy, some of the main features of strategy and supply and some of the more opaque elements of this uh, very esoteric game that we have here. So first we're gonna start with uh, just a little bit of maneuvering on the battle map. Just some really, really basic command and control type stuff. So for that, we're going to start uh, just on uh, the historical battle of Manassas and I'm going to take Fog of War off, mostly just so we can see the AI moving around and we can use it to talk a little bit more about some other things. So uh, I'm going to start the battle. I'm going to shuffle some things around a little bit and then I'm going to come back for you and we will start a little tutorial here. Okay, so when you first load into a battle in Grand Tactician Civil War, you're going to get this screen here, which is going to show some of the military telegraphs and, and some of the, the kind of flavor for the disposition of the battle and i'm just going to say for right now this isn't super duper important so i'm just going to tell this stuff to go away and i'm going to click on the hq report thing and make that go away we'll cover that in a future video but for right now i just want to focus on the tactical maneuvering of your units on the battlefield so i'm going to shuffle some things around and i'll be right back in another moment here Okay, we're back. So you see you see that I've, I've sort of shuffled around a few of the units on the battlefield, and you can obviously see over here the Confederates are moving. I'm not super duper worried about that. Again, my plan isn't to win the battle. I just want to show some of the, the basic kind of movement controls. And I've got this sort of set up to hopefully catch any of their attacks that come come up that way. We'll see that if, if anything happens. But for right now, I want to focus on this little cluster over here on the eastern side of the map. So Number one, we have to know which units these are. So we can do that in a couple of ways. Obviously, we can click on this. This is the first division under General Daniel Tyler. Uh, it is roped to, you can see the line that goes from the headquarters company of the first division to the Army of Northeastern Virginia's headquarters totally, right? So that's Irvin McDowell. So another way to see all of this stuff represented in one place is to look at the order of battle. So the order of battle is going to show you your whole army, or at least one part of the whole army uh, that's here. This, this is a single core, to use a slightly later term kind of in, in terms of the game. So this core is under the command of Irvin McDowell, and he has several uh, units, subdivided units up here, and most of these are called divisions. So when you look at these, right, he's got the first division under Dan Tyler. That is comprised of three brigades of infantry and a battalion of artillery. And that's basically it. And, and, you know, it's this, the division is basically the largest sort of single maneuvering unit you'll probably use on the battlefield, like giving orders all at once. Um, and you'll spend a lot of your time giving orders initially to, to single brigades. Um, now, curiously, one thing you might notice is you see that McDowell has four stars above his thing. That means he's the commander of this core, of this army. Uh, the division commanders here, Dan Tyler has two stars. Hunter has two stars, Heinzelman has two stars, etc. But we look over here, the 4th Brigade, and that's Richardson, Israel B. Richardson. He's only got one star, and he has no divisional level of command. Which means that he's taking his orders directly from Irvin McDowell. Which is going to complicate things a little bit based on how the game prioritizes how orders sort of filter down to other commands. So for instance... If I want to give an order to a unit, to a brigade in my first division, let's say I just want to take the first division of artillery and I want to move it up so that it gets in range of this piece of artillery over here, Kemper's battery. So what I want to do is give this guy just direct individual orders to move his artillery up to probably about here. That should probably put him in range. And now you see this little orange kind of clock thing. We'll get to that in a second. But for right now, I'm just going to confirm the order and I'm going to let it go. Look at these little, if you saw the blue dashed lines, you'll see it again when I ordered infantry. That is the order filtering from the division commander to the battery commander. So if I want to give another uh, order to the first brigade, if I want the first brigade to go up and support the artillery, I'm going to order them to about right there. And you see that same arrow going forward to that brigade. And I'm going to let it go. And that same little orange clock is going to come up. And I'm going to hover over it and just confirm the move. Just 
confirm it. We, we'll get to that menu in a moment as to why that works, but we're just going to watch these guys go forward first, right? So that's fine. All the orders right now are coming from their division commander. Now, if I wanted to do something else, like let's say I wanted to move the entire first division, I will be giving that order from clicking Daniel Tyler and assembling my division that way. So I'm going to advance time. We're going to let this, uh, these guys get into their initial formation. And then what I'm going to do is give a command to the entire division and we'll see how that changes things. Okay, so I've, these guys are in place. The division artillery is already opening up on that battery over there. So before I do anything else, I wanna give this whole division orders. I actually want everybody up on the same line. So what I'm gonna do is give that order like this. I wanna put them in more or less, leave them in more or less the same place, but I want my infantry up here to support this battery. So I'm gonna do that. And the same thing happens. You'll see this, right? That same little orange clock shows up and I'm just gonna confirm the order issue it. Now, the dotted line is coming from McDowell himself. McDowell is actually sending orders to Tyler, and Tyler is sending orders to each of his brigade commanders. So the, the order is actually much slower because it's coming from the chief of the army here, the, the, the commander of the entire army. So those orders actually have to filter down to these individual brigades, and they wait until every brigade has been told what to do before any of them start moving. So this is really key to understand, this kind of basic gross movement mechanics of your divisions and your brigades, because this is going to determine how long certain things take. So generally, if you wanna give quicker orders, you wanna give them at the brigade level. You wanna give an order individually to the third brigade or the second brigade or the first brigade or whatever it is. And they'll perform those orders faster so long as they're within the command radius of their general. So I've got Tyler clicked. He's got this big blue circle and anything within that circle, he can give an individual order to that brigade and it'll happen fairly quickly. He's still gonna have to send a physical courier, but he's gonna make sure that that order gets there, right? So McDowell, you'll notice, has a much larger command radius. That's because he is the army commander. He's in charge of the entire army. So his command radius is a lot bigger. Uh, but what I wanna do now is give an order to Richardson and to Hunt's artillery. So we'll, because these guys are detached, we can look again in the order of battle here, they are only getting orders from McDowell. They don't have a division commander. So each order is going to be performed by these guys acting on orders from McDowell himself. So what I'm gonna do is order Israel B. Richardson forward with uh, a single order, just like that, just straight up. I'm also gonna move my fourth brigade batteries to this position on a hill over here. And same thing. So we're going to watch this happen, right? So we can literally physically watch a courier detach from the headquarters company of Irvin McDowell and ride over here to Richardson to tell him what to do. And this is, a, you know, a sort of a realistic function of what a command headquarters was supposed to do. Uh, this isn't just McDowell, right? This is a headquarters company. This is a whole lot of guys. Uh, a lot of them are couriers and dispatch riders. A lot of them are musicians. They're clerks at the headquarters and other officers who are waiting to sort of disseminate and organize the information that's coming into the headquarters and get that out to the division commanders so they can get that out to the brigade commanders, right? So this order went by courier to Richardson, who is now moving forward. And it also got to Richardson's batteries here. And they're uh, going to embark to get their position right here on the slope of this hill. And we're going to be firing at Longstreet before too long. Uh, meanwhile, my first division is also moving up, and so I'm just going to advance time, and we'll come back once these guys get deployed. Okay, so now we're going to go into some of the more, I guess, kind of advanced features of what you're able to do here in the game. And we're going to start with the artillery, because the artillery is already firing. So first things first, we can watch our batteries here fire on the enemy, and that's pretty sweet. But if we click here, we'll get a whole ton of information about this unit, about their disposition, about their morale, their experience, everything else. That's all over here on this panel. So we get their Captain Romain B. Ayers. Uh, he is the he's a professional officer from the artillery. We've got a whole bunch of information about him. And importantly, we have the number of men, 
the number of losses they've taken, the number of guns he has in his battalion, uh, and their morale. Their current morale is 68%. And we can look at individually why certain things have happened. Um, he's got a morale debuff because it's their first battle. Uh, so that goes down quite a bit because they've never been in battle before. They don't know what they're doing. Um, so a couple of really important features before we move on here is that morale you have to pay close attention to because if this morale gets below about 20%, it's going the, the unit will break. They're going to break and leave the field. And one of the, the better ways to sort of make sure that's uh, how close they are to breaking is to look at this thing here called loss resilience. So these hearts, five and a half hearts, four and a half hearts, are white right now. If they get red, that means they're taking casualties. And the more casualties they take, the more likely they are to uh, to break and withdraw. So what I'm going to do is, now that we've kind of taken a look at a little bit of what that means, I'm actually going to go into my artillery sub panel. And I'm going to order this unit of 10 pounder parrot rifles, very accurate artillery, to counter battery fire. So they're going to prioritize firing at enemy artillery. And that again is going to come from their division commander. Who's going to send a little courier or make a little bugle or whatever and tell them to go into uh, into counter battery fire. And they're likely going to fire at either this guy over here or this battery back here behind the trees. You can see. So if we zoom back out, right? They're well within range. They're likely going to fire at Kemper's battery over here. Now we can get some information about the enemy as well. We can look at the first brigade artillery. We can see that we've inflicted three casualties against them, which is fine. It's pretty good for long range artillery fire. Uh, and that order has now been dispatched. There's no current order moving and we can watch these guys. They'll start to shift around in a bit. We advance time just a little bit. They're loading up their guns and they're gonna swivel and they're gonna start firing. So we can actually see the shells sort of landing over here. Um, it doesn't look like they're actually firing at the 4th Brigade Artillery at all. Yeah, so this little target is showing that our 10-pound parrots are firing over here at the 1st Brigade Artillery. So we're going to let that roll for a bit, and we're going to come back to this guy over here, who is similarly, we see his target, he's firing here at Longstreet's Brigade, and he's going to keep doing that until we tell them otherwise. Um, but there are a couple of other things that we can do. So we can say fire at will, which is what they're working on. Now they're going to fire at just the, the best the best opportunity they have to fire is what they're going to fire at. So obviously the infantry have a similar panel. They've got a formation panel, so we can put them in various formations, the square and the attack column. I'll cover those in future videos. But what I want to concentrate on right now are this six little things here. So first things first. If we look at the same info panel, we see how they're armed, how well trained they are, how experienced they are, that kind of thing. They also have the first battle debuff, and they're always going to have this cut off because they don't have a division commander. They're an open brigade only under the direction of Irving McDowell, the army commander. Uh, so they're always going to have that debuff when it comes down. So even though their morale is still 70%, they've got a couple of debuffs, mostly because of inexperience and not being under the command of a nearby commander. Uh, but what I want to do is get them to go in long range. So again, we're going to get a courier that's going to come from McDowell himself. I'm all going to move him a little bit closer. Um, and then they're going to switch from engaging at middle range. You can see the sort of dashed line here. That's where they will be firing if they engage in combat. Um, but their max range is out here. And because they've got smoothbore muskets, their max range is about 100, 120 yards, something like that. So our artillery is doing okay. Um, they've inflicted seven casualties. It doesn't seem like a lot, but artillery tends not to actually inflict that many casualties. It's sort of a quirk of the system. Um, but for whatever reason, they just don't inflict too many casualties. And they're still sort of getting the range. And they're not super experienced. So the fact that they've inflicted any casualties at all is, is, is pretty good. All right. So these guys are now at long range. Now, I'm not going to have them engage in, across the river here, across the creek. Instead, what I'm going to do is get a better look at them by deploying some skirmishers. 
So the skirmishers just detach. It's about a battalion. So that's uh, one subdivision of a regiment that kind of comes out. It's 200 men. And they're going to stay up in front of their unit. You can give them all sorts of other orders. And they will fire at anything that they encounter. But they're going to be doing it from taking cover. They're going to be moving for fairly quickly and kind of firing in little pairs. So they're not actually going to be trying to engage in this long linear line firing volley. So they'll be firing individually as targets present themselves and skirmishing, right? They also have better vision. So if we had Fog of War on, you would see how much better they could see. You actually saw that because they're keeping an eye on them, we can see that Longstreet's men have just decided to lay down because they're being attacked by this artillery. So good for them. They want to avoid some casualties. That's smart. So my skirmishers, um, I can just move pretty much wherever. And this is where these little bugle commands are going to come important. So that, again, that little orange thing. I want to tell these guys to advance. Advance means that they will engage any enemy that they come into range with as they're moving up to that spot. Um, now, if I were to tell these guys to move away from the enemy, it's going to give me a slightly different panel. So as I release that, right? Now I get fall back and retreat. So if I give them fall back, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to move backward, but they're going to continue firing at anything that is in front of them toward the enemy. So as I do that, if they were engaged, they would continue firing. So back over here, I want to deal with this piece of artillery. I don't want to fire at it all the rest of the day. I want to bring my, my parrots in to fire at something else. And this long range duel is just, it's not going to happen. I mean, like... I could try to uh, take these guys out a little faster, but I think what I'm going to do is engage with my infantry. So because I want to be able to move my infantry at the division level, but I don't want to move my artillery with them, I'm going to detach my artillery. So every unit also has this commander subunit. So if we hit, a, if we hit this button here, detach, that means that they will no longer be taking their orders from Tyler at the division level. So once these guys are detached, I can move my three infantry brigades forward without moving my artillery. And later videos, we'll get into kind of how to optimize your order of battle, depending on how you kind of like to play. I personally don't like dragging around my guns when I'm advancing my infantry. I like my infantry to move independently. So that's what I'm doing here. But now that they're detached, when I give orders, I'm just going to be giving orders to my infantry. So I want to move my infantry actually a lot closer to this artillery. We're going to cross the creek and engage it. Uh, I'm also going to have them just go forward. I don't want them to attack quite yet. But again, we see that it's coming from McDowell to Tyler off to his brigade commanders. Now this becomes really important because we have a lot more units on the field, right? We've got these two, we've got two divisions over here kind of watching Sudley Springs, and we also have two smaller reserve divisions back here. Let's say I want to bring these guys forward, right? I want to get Runyon's reserve division up here to support. Now, a couple of things here. You see that they are showing the path that they're taking is mostly going to be using roads because roads make for faster travel. So as they go, they're going to go. But the order is going to come all the way from McDowell, ride on a courier, a physical actual courier in the game is going to ride across all this terrain to give orders to Runyon, who will then give orders to his brigades, who will then march off and meet up over here. And the same thing is going to happen if I try to give my 5th Division orders. So this is another reserve division, but I want them to come up here and bring their artillery and two other brigades of infantry. So the same thing is going to happen. I'm going to have this massive order delay because I need to I need to make sure McDowell himself is sending a courier, sending a physical person to come and order those guys up. So that's going to happen. It's just going to take a long time. These guys are both outside my command radius. He has to send this dude. The dude's going to go and tell these guys to come to come up. So that's going to take a long time. Now, in the meantime, because my infantry is going to obscure my targeting of this battery, I'm going to stop these guys firing at that battery. I'm just going to order them to limber up and I'm going to move them closer so that they can actually engage against Longstreet's infantry brigade over here so they can support these guys. Let's see how they're doing. 22 casualties. That's not so bad. Okay, I've given a bit more orders. Now we can see that this 1st Brigade Artillery is firing 
at my brigades here. And we could actually, again, I'm going to pause it real quick. We can look at the disposition of these men and as it changes, depending on what's happening to them. So we can look here at Brigadier General Robert Schenck. He's got Springfield muskets. It's also his first battle, although he is under the influence of his division commander. That's Tyler. Uh, he is supported by other units around him, but he's getting a debuff because he's under artillery fire. So we can actually look at how this manifests here uh, in his morale cap. So we can see all those positives, right? Basic rally value plus 10. He's supported by 5% because he's nearby other units. Uh, his nearby commander gives him a plus 7%, and he's got a minus 1% because he's under artillery fire. So one thing that I could do as I advance time is I could actually order him to lay down. And that's going to help deal with the artillery fire uh, a little bit. But I actually want to be a bit more aggressive. I don't want to be under artillery fire all the time. So what I'm going to do is detach skirmishers from Sherman and Keyes' brigades. And I'm going to use them to target the artillery and focus the artillery's attention on the skirmishers while I let my full brigades maneuver around. So I want Keyes' detachment to come over here and engage this battery on the flank. And I'm going to have them advance so they fire as they go. And because they're skirmishers, they can move quite a lot more rapidly. So I'm going to go to movement panel down here, click it open, and tell them to run. Now Sherman, his skirmishers are armed with rifles. So they have a lot longer range, and I'm going to have them do the same thing. They're going to advance, I'm going to have them run, and as soon as they get within range of the first brigade artillery, they're going to start firing on it. So let's just watch that go down. You can see that they are targeting Keyes' detachment, and because they're skirmishers, they're a lot harder to hit, and they're not going to be taking as many casualties as the full brigade. Uh, and the artillery is already starting to withdraw. So because they're no longer a threat to my infantry brigades, I'm going to move Keyes over here across the creek. I'm going to have them go, and I'm going to move Sherman across the creek as well. And now I'm inflicting a lot more casualties with my skirmishers than I ever was with the artillery, which is something to pay attention to. And because they're taken by flank fire, they have low cohesion, they are broken. And I just had Keyes' men charge. They're only skirmishers, they're not super great in melee, but they're going against a routing unit. And so in order to get them to charge, you just hold Alt, and right click uh, and they're going to charge and so generally charging into fleeing artillery mostly just means that you're going to be able to capture more guns uh, than you would otherwise so as that's going right uh, our division commander is going to move a little bit closer i'm going to unlimber these guys so they can deploy and i'm going to have them engage firing at will so they can shoot over here um, at longstreet's infantry brigade So while I'm moving my uh, Tyler's division across the creek here to come and take this gun and to engage against Longstreet's men, I'm going to demonstrate a couple of the artillery uh, things that you can do here. So one of the trickier ones is bombardment. So you saw earlier that I could switch them to counter battery fire. So they'll concentrate on firing at enemy batteries. But you can also switch them to engage with bombardment. And bombardment brings up this massive, ugly bullseye. And you have to use it, you have to sort of you click on the thing, it brings up the bullseye, and then you have to really fiddle with finding a place to engage. So I'm going to right click and hold on the terrain behind this unit. And that is going to give me a little indicator of where they're going to start firing. And as soon as I let this go, it's going to bring up this sort of, when do we begin, right? Because they have to sort of lay the things out, and prioritize, get some ammo stowed up and everything, do some preparation, and then they're going to start the bombardment. So you can fiddle with this. I usually just leave it at, right at the time that it's starting, because why not? Uh, and as soon as they are ready, they're going to just start rapid firing their guns in this area. They're not going to concentrate on any particular unit. They just want to hit this area here. And you can do that with all of your artillery. I can actually have these guys do the same thing. Um, but it might be more useful, because these are rifled artillery pieces, to engage them in counter-battery fire and start hammering that other uh, artillery there. 
So that's what I'm going to do. So right now, they're still you can still see that they are targeting Longstreet's Brigade. But instead, I'm going to want them to switch their fire over the 4th Brigade Artillery here. Let this go. So here comes our reserve divisions. Might get Tidbull's artillery into action here while we get these our uh, infantry divisions sorted out. Let's let them get in formation. And we want to bring them a little bit closer to the action. So we're going to order them just to go. I don't want them to engage anything on the way. And it looks like we've actually had our 1st Division artillery has routed the enemy 4th Brigade artillery. And they've taken some losses in doing so. They've taken six losses, probably from counter-battery fire uh, on their own. These men are still firing. They're still going in their bombard. And you'll notice that both, both of them have earned a little bit of experience. This little bar right here shows them shows how much experience they have earned based on their combat so far. Return Keyes' detachment back to his parent brigade. And we're going to let time advance a little bit. So you can see uh, the, the units kind of get a little clumsy when they get toward the place they have to deploy. And that's mostly just showing that they're deploying from column into line. So marching column into a fighting line. And that just happens. It's not a big deal. Uh, but what I want to do is get these guys to come down here and engage against uh, Longstreet's men over here. Now, we can see the dotted line over here that's showing where those orders are coming from. So I'm going to do this even though I know that the order is going to take some time, and that's fine. But I'm also going to give them the order to advance. So they will engage any non-routing enemy on the way. I'm going to let that happen. Get some time going. And let's bring the 5th Division Artillery Batteries into the action here. They've only got 6 pounders. Not terribly impressive pieces of artillery, but, you know, they do the job. So you see, again, how much faster that order filtered down to get the artillery. They're almost all in place by the time that the order, just to my division over here, arrived to the commander, to Tyler, the commander of my third division. So that just sort of speaks to how careful you should be when you think about the orders that you want to give to your units, because it's it's important. The order that you give them uh, and the distance at which it's going to take place and the distance of your commander to the unit that they're interacting with is really important. So you have to keep an eye on all of this stuff all the time. Now, these guys are idle. And they're idle because they don't have any good targets. Because the only targets that I told them to select were enemy batteries. So if I wanted to have them engage this infantry brigade here, I have to turn them back onto fire at will. And they'll fire at any target that presents itself that they're capable of hitting. So in a moment, we'll see the, uh, the my parrots open up on the infantry brigade. And the same will be true once these guys finish deploying. So these little blue dots will go away once they're finished deploying. So let's advance some time get them deployed and there they go so they're they are now firing at longstreet's fourth brigade as well it's looking pretty bad for longstreet and what we want to do is stack up as many advantages as we have against longstreet and force him to withdraw so i want to make sure that i have infantry ready to exploit any any advantage that we manage to maintain and i want to also have infantry support my batteries because sometimes the enemy will make a foolish charge and capture your guns and it's suicidal, but they might end up capturing your guns anyway. So I just want to make sure I have men there to support. Um, I'm also going to shift my skirmishers forward a little bit, and I'm going to move Richardson forward a little bit more as well. And you notice you can give all these orders right here on this big map screen. We don't actually have to zoom in any farther to give those orders. We can just do it right from this kind of zoomed out position. It's a little easier to see what else is going on. So, right, if we wanted to kind of look at, see, what are the Confederates doing? Nothing. They're just holding their locations over here. They're not even trying to engage anywhere else. And that's fine. Let them. So how is old old Pete doing over here? 75 casualties. It's not, it's not too bad. Uh, he's, being, he's under bombardment. 
Uh, we are stacking up a bunch of debuffs, basically. He's being flanked, uh, although he is in cover, and he's being engaged by artillery, and that's sort of bad news for, for his morale. So we're going to let this bombardment keep up until my division gets in place, and then we're going to engage with our infantry. So again, let's speed up time. Okay, so now remember, we're about to engage here. We've got enfilading artillery fire. I want to get in here and I would like to capture this brigade if I can. And so rather than trying to give all of my orders from Tyler or from uh, McDowell to Tyler to the brigades, I'm at the point where right now what I want to do is send my brigades in individually. So I'm going to give them orders that way. So second brigade under Schenck, I want you to move forward here. And importantly, I'm going to give them the advance order. So as soon as they get in range, they're going to start firing on Longstreet's brigade. Same thing with Sherman here. He's firing. Uh, I'm going to have him go forward and advance so that he fires when his men get in range. Now, he's got rifles, which means his middle range engagement is quite a lot longer than Shanks. So he will probably start firing first. And then I want Keys, although he's sort of in this rear portion, I want Keys to engage on the right over here. Also, again, giving them the advance order so that they move a little quicker, or so that they fire as they're moving. Now, none of these guys have any experience. No, nobody has any perks. I do have a unit on this map with perks, but I think I'm gonna leave perks to a, a later video. So let's speed this up until they start engaging. Keys here is uh, coming, or Shank here is coming into range pretty soon. Sherman is coming into range soon. You can see this kind of, the chunk taken out of that range indicator, basically because we've got friendlies in, in the way. So here they go. And Sherman's men are now advancing and firing. So you can see again, the same sort of thing. They're targeting uh, the enemy brigade there. And they're going to continue firing until I tell them, until either they break range or I tell them to stop or change their range. But Shank is out of range, so I'm going to actually increase his range, have him fire at long range. So that's going to be another order that's going to come from Tyler. And it's going to take a little bit. And now we also see that Longstreet has decided to wheel his men around so that he's facing the bigger threat, which is our infantry. And our infantry are inflicting a lot more casualties than artillery is, even though the artillery is quite close and has been firing for a long time. So critically, I want to make sure that I turn this gun onto fire at will so they're not bombarding this whole area and hitting my own men. So a couple more debuffs to take a look at, right? Sherman is not in cover. They're firing an enemy who is behind cover, and that gives them a slight debuff as well. So these guys are now firing at long range, but they're not in range. So I'm going to have them move up just a few feet so that they can start engaging as well. And now look, my first brigade is lagging a little bit behind, but I want them to speed up, click on movement, click on double time, and they're going to start hustling a little bit more. So now, because I have control of the creek, I want to make sure that these guys don't cross as they try to withdraw. So I'm going to close their ability to withdraw by advancing my infantry so that they can cover the creek. And we can just sort of, again, advance time and just kind of watch this all take place. You can see the, uh, the sort of buffs and debuffs are kind of stacking up over here. Um, and Longstreet's men are having kind of a bad time. I mean, I'm taking casualties as well. You can see I've lost 52 men in Sherman's brigade, and I've lost, I'm losing quite a few men in Shank's second brigade here because he is right in front. He's, he's taking up all of the brunt of the fire uh, that Longstreet's men are pouring in. But again, they're getting massive debuffs because they're so badly outflanked. And their morale is crumbling. And I'm just going to keep firing into them until that happens. I'm also going to bring these guys a little bit closer. And I'm going to have them hustle. 
So what I'd like to do, because this is an isolated brigade, is capture this brigade, which is sort of tricky to do, and sometimes, like, the, uh, uh, the actual kind of execution of the game is a little funky. But they are running. They're currently running. So what I'm going to do is order all of my infantry brigades to charge. And again, just alt, right click, you can order them to charge. Um, it's a little funky, but we'll see if it happens. So when you start hearing that little the roar, kind of the rebel yell sort of thing, that means that people are engaged in melee. And you have to kind of keep giving the orders because they'll stop and it's a whole big mess. But hopefully, if we've got any luck, I should get Longstreet here to surrender. Or instead, he's just going to swim across the creek <laughs> and escape, which happens pretty often as well. In any case, that's it for the first video. That's just some sort of micromanagement on the battle map. Uh, and I can come back later for a slightly more advanced tutorial about brigade and core uh, maneuvering, that kind of thing. If you have any specific requests using cavalry, using artillery, anything like that, let me know and I'll put it in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.